really happy that, well, some faces I recognize from last time, so that's really good. This is the second episode of our uh, symposium series on science communication to different audiences. Uh, last time we had a series on communicating to the general public through the media, and this time we're focusing on communicating science results to policy. How do you make sure that your results have impact in legislature, in policy? Uh, and to do that, we'll have three speakers today and a panel discussion at the end. Um, to introduce the speakers, um, I'm going to introduce them now briefly, and I'm not going to give full bios, because they'll be telling their story to you themselves. Um, we'll have Caitlin Hall first. She give, uh, she'll give a keynote-like lecture. She'll be followed up by Paul Dieter from the Rathaus Institute. Then we'll have a short break for a cup of coffee and some refreshments. And finally, we'll have Robert Verwey from the Dutch Rijkswaterstaat, part of the central Dutch government. And after Robert's talk, we'll have room for a, a panel discussion. I would like you to, I'd like to ask you if you have any questions during these presentations. Please write them down, and we'll have them all incorporated in the panel discussion. So we don't do any questions right after the speakers. My name is Wolfert. I've been doing this for, well, this is the second time. I'm really happy to see you all here again. Um, and with all of that, I would immediately like to give the floor to Caitlin Hall. Caitlin, please. All right. Thanks, Rolf. Ah, wonderful. All right. So, before we get too deep into it, um, I am a real person. I am not just someone that Rolf flew in. It's like a figurehead. Um, so, before we get started, who here runs? Raise your hand. All right. Keep them raised. Keep them raised. All right, who here has climbed? Who here is a grad student or has ever been in grad school? And, all right, all right, getting almost everybody. All right, who likes to go out for beers on Fridays? All right, so at some point, everyone raised their hands. Uh, th this seems a little silly, but we're gonna come back to it later. So, just wanna get to know the audience a little bit, which is really important when you're trying to work with policymakers or really anyone you're working with people, you need to start developing that relationship. There we go. All right, so like I said, I'm a grad student, uh, as well as a runner and a climber that likes to go out for beers on Fridays. Uh, but I also do a lot of work in policy. I also do a lot of work in policy. Now, this kind of might seem like a little bit of a juxtaposition because my research, I use bacteria to try and strengthen the ground, uh, but I found that I wanted to have a lot of impact on society and the world around me, and I didn't see a direct link to that in my everyday research. And especially in the US, uh, there was a tax bill that was proposed in 2016, 2017, where all of our tuition remission would have been taxed. So I could just see my stipend going from something that was livable to something that would not be livable. This would have affected me, but also almost everyone that I knew. So then I was like, well, what are we gonna do about that? Like, we have to do something. And so I started getting more involved. And I also started seeing the impact, and this is US specific, but the impact of policy and society had on my research and research in the university. So this was a proposed budget where you can see that uh, all of these are different funding agencies for research, particularly scientific research. Everything was negative. Everyone doing research and getting federal funding was very nervous. And so we started to feel, the, as, as scientists, the impact that policy had on our everyday research. And this started to worry a lot of grad students. So a lot of them were incentivized to try and create their own policy groups, their own science policy groups, so that they could have a voice. Because we see the challenges, now we want to do something about it. And so I started my own as well, called the Arizona Science Policy Network uh, in Arizona. So just to give a little perspective, um, we're in the West Coast, uh, fairly close to Mexico. And, um, 
desert. It's beautiful, amazing, quite dry. As I was biking here, I definitely biked through the rain, so it's a nice change. Uh, but what's really nice is that we have such a wide variety of students because we have a lot of um, culture coming into this one place. So we are able to have a lot of diverse voices in our network. And we first started naturally with a happy hour where we invited different scientists to discuss, all right, we are scientists, we are students, what can we do with our science beyond just publications? We wanted to take this to policy. And our goal was to engage with state level decision making. So this map shows just different regions and representative districts within our state because we were like, we found that everyone seems to be focused on the federal level, but our region policy affects us just as much as what's happening to us as a country. Plus, we're in the capital, so it was very easy for us to just travel to actually talk with policymakers one on one rather than flying six hours to try and go to DC where our federal capital. So we were able to invite local Congress people, so at the state level representatives and senators, to come to our same bar that we had our first happy hour and discuss how can we use our science that we were researching and implement it on a policy level. And we did this by honestly just emailing them. Hi, I'm Caitlin Hall. I am a researcher in your district. Can you come talk to us? Politicians are very, in the US are excited to talk to their constituents because we're voting for them. So naturally they're like, I'm pretty great. I talk to my constituents, I'm doing these things. But also they really care. So like they're also champions of science and they're champions of the issues that we're looking at. But during this meeting, we realized that all of the scientists had very different experience levels. So that brings me to the first lesson is you need to make sure that you're taking advantage of short courses and trainings because we need to make sure that you're practicing what you are doing and learning these techniques and then putting them into practice. And these are things that after doing a quick search that we can do as grad students because we're, we have to take courses and get these uh, course requirements filled out. We can take science policy classes and these trainings to satisfy requirements. We didn't have that at my university for scientists specifically. There were a lot of things for policy makers and people trying to go into that. So I created my own course and taught it. It was all right. Uh, it was a grassroots effort for sure. Uh, I called other experts because I knew that I didn't know. So I was able to kind of outsource out what I was doing. But like I said, practice what you're learning. So like you're gonna be getting advice from myself and these other amazing speakers but that's just the start. You have to go do it in order to become engaged and to actually make an impact. So we did that by taking 60 scientists to our Arizona State Capitol to discuss uh, the drought contingency plan and to discuss water issues. By this, we attended congressional committee meetings and we actually testified about bills. So I'm a water scientist and I was able to speak with my expertise on a bill that was coming through, like this is a good idea, this isn't a good idea and other students were able to do that as well. We also had uh, lunch meetings with our congressional representatives as well. So we we're having these one-on-one -on -one meetings. Which brings me to the second lesson, is that you need to plan as much as you can, but it can only get you so far. And this is gonna go for every meeting that I've ever had with a policymaker. I might have a 15 minute meeting, maybe they're busy that day and it only goes down to 10. So when you're going in, you still treat everyone like a person. You get to know them. Like I tried, I got to know you guys a little bit, but also make sure that you get to your point quickly and concisely, uh, and that you have these contingency plans in mind. So we had 65 people packed into a room of 30 because the schedule changed, and we hope that a fire didn't break out. My third lesson is don't go it alone. I think that it's really intimidating to start doing something new that I've never done before. And I made it a group effort by inviting some of my friends and colleagues that had totally different experiences than me. So when, if you're interested in starting into this realm, there's no reason you need to do this alone. But while my uh, colleagues are amazing, it's so much more powerful to have an ally on the inside because they make the magic happen. So the assistant to a senator is the one that helped us actually get this event going. 
And he's the person that I'm able to literally text because we've gotten to that level of saying like, this is an issue that's coming up. And then he's the one, he's the gatekeeper for all of this information going to the senator. So he's like, you are worthwhile. This is, this is a good idea. And he sends this information in like policy briefs and policy memos over to the senator. So what am I doing now? Our group advises legislators on climate change, mining, artificial intelligence, and all of these things because we're a consortium of about 40 people and we've been an organization for a year. But I think that just goes to show like when you have a lot of people that care, you can get a lot more done. So these are some of the people that I'm working with. We're working with people at the state level, but also at the federal level. So we're starting to branch out a little bit, especially when issues go across state lines. Now, some of the bills that I'm specifically working on, we're developing a climate action plan for the state and the city of Phoenix. We're also working on heat adaptation and mitigation, setting standards for emerging contaminants in groundwater, banning single-use items in government buildings. Someone made a joke about single-term representatives, so just in case you were thinking it, someone else got to you first. As well as artificial intelligence. Again, I'm an environmental engineer, but I'm able to work with other people who have, say, artificial intelligence experience, so I'm the liaison between these other scientists to get them talking to the right people. But how do we communicate with, st with multiple stakeholders? It's really challenging, and I happily talked to Evo earlier. Evo is a friend of mine. He's on the geotech faculty. Evo, have you climbed before? All right, so if Evo is a policymaker, I have done a little bit of research ahead of time. I know that he's a climber. Evo, where's a good place to climb in Delft? Just down the road. Amazing. So, pretending that Evo is a policymaker, we're having this conversation. All right, again, it's just down the road. Now, we've started this report, we've started developing this relationship. Uh, are you, perhaps, I mean, this isn't because we're friends now. Are you more willing to take a little bit more time out of your day to talk about things? Say, like, all right, you've, you've, I've gotten your advice on things. You ready to hash into the details? Yeah, I think so. You've asked right. me about me, now I've asked about you. Yeah, exactly. So like, I've done my research, I've looked at his Twitter feed, I've looked at things that he's voted on before, Eva, the representative of Delft, of this room. Like, I, I, I know things that he cares about, I know things that he wants to do, and what he really cares about. So with that, I'm able to start that relationship building, and then he and I can now work on things together. When I meet him later, I'm going to say, I went to Delft Blau down the road, it was amazing, thank you so much. Do you have another suggestion? So like, still working on that relationship. Sorry, you got the microphone a little late, so. Uh, but more importantly, Let's say that he's busy that day. I want to make sure that I succinctly get to the so what. I never forget that Evo likes to climb. I will usually start that relate that rapport and that conversation that way. But I want to make sure that when we're getting through, that I'm getting through like why I'm there. Like, sure, I want a good climbing recommendation, but what I actually care about is I want him to do work on heat mitigation, on flood mitigation, things like this. So making sure that I make him care about the issue that I want him to care about. But I'm just one scientist, I'm just one group, I'm one perspective. There are also other people working with decision makers. It's not just environment things, it's not just floods, it's not just heat, it's not just climate. There's a lot more in this. There's other people in the public and other priorities that people need to try and balance. So I have started working with community leaders we're going out into the community all throughout the state to try and get other people's perspectives. And that even includes people in tribal nations, which are sovereign. So I find out what are, what are these people's priorities, I work with them to try and figure out, okay, this is what they care about, these are the things that we uh, can come together to work with the policymakers and these community leaders. Okay, so I'm not gonna talk at you all day, that is boring, you are, I'm going to do it on this side. All right. Evo, raise your hand, please. Thank you. All right. Everyone on this side of Evo, you're group one. Uh, Love the lady in beige. Could you raise your hand? Thank you. Gentleman in blue, raise your hand. You were two. Uh, all righty. Then, uh, woman in glasses, right behind you, raise your hand. 
All right, everyone lower, you're three. Everyone higher, you're four. So, we are going to play a game. Everyone that's a one, you are going to be an environmental scientist in this issue. Everyone that's a two, you are a climate policy director. Everyone that's a three, you're an emergency room doctor. You guys are doing very well for yourselves. Everyone that's a four, you're a farmer. Thank you for your service. Okay, take a picture if you need to. The different uh, points that we have here are your motivations. These are things that you care about. If I am a farmer, I want to make sure that I produce crops. If I am an emergency room doctor, I don't want people to die. Like everyone wants that, of course, but like especially the emergency room doctors. If I'm an environmental scientist, I'm working with policymakers because I want to see good in the world, but I also know that my funding is being, or that my research is being funded by the NWO or NSF. I'm trying to get these analogs in. So I also want to make sure that my interests are at stake, or that my interests are being considered, but that my work also matters. All right, studying. Give you 20 more seconds. Probably not. I'm pretty, I'm pretty impatient. I'm a kinetic person. Okay, but the idea is that you guys are going to actually be voting on policy. So, I have three different policy solutions for a problem that I'll be bringing up in a second. Now, you guys are going to vote as if you were these people for a particular policy. All right, 20 seconds, sweet. Welcome to Rivertown. We have a problem in Rivertown. This is a fake town. We have a lot of rain. I felt like it was fitting here. It was either drought or rain. It's raining. It seemed like a good fit then. So in the entire country, we are experiencing way more precipitation than ever before, and it's only getting worse thank you climate change. Now River Channel exists in that 71%, that dark blue area. We are not looking forward to flooding because we are River Town, so actually named because we are on a river, and because extreme precipitation can lead to flooding, this is a problem, obviously, because we are we don't want uh, our lives to be obstructed, but also this has a lot of other impacts to people in this town. So, who lives here? We have a city center along the river, but then this town is actually quite spread out. So, uh, the orange is like medium populated, yellow is lightly populated, so rural areas, farms. Uh, red is, again, like your, your downtown area. We want to protect that as well, because that's where all the good restaurants are. Okay, so, again, why does this matter? Two weeks ago, now let's say a year ago, a year ago, we had so much rain that our city center, shown here, completely flooded. I live here, I am a basement dweller, so my entire flat was flooded. That sucked. So, I'm, like, I care, uh, but so do a lot of other people around me. So many businesses were in this area as well. But, what else makes us vulnerable is that we have a hospital in a floodplain area. And this hospital is, so you emergency room doctors, this hospital is a crisis center. So if people are being forced to evacuate their homes, they actually go to the hospital because it's on high ground. It's well protected, we've thought this one through. So it's a place where people can find refuge. The emergency room doctor, if you remember your placard, uh, cares about this one because like, you're very invested in this community and you are, you are working at this hospital. So you're, you see people coming in with, um, that have been injured during this flood. So you want this to obviously stop happening. Now if you're a farmer, you see that over time you have a lot of, uh, because of flooding you're seeing a lower crop, leaf, uh, crop yield. And this is because when the heavy rains come through your nutrients get washed away. But then also we've noticed that if you have a high precipitation period, it's followed by drought. So, we also want this to stop happening. Uh, climate scientists, you guys are like, oh yes, this is because of climate change. This is the problem. We can do something about this. And then uh, the people that are uh, the climate change director, you are the ones that are setting the policy. Now, we'll be evaluating the policies by three criteria, economic, environmental, and social. These are just three ones that were chosen for this. However, there's like 18 different ones that we could go for. But these are the ones that we want to focus on today. All right, policy one. So with policy one, it's called keep it out. Now, take notes if you need to, but keep in mind 
you were playing your role, what policy do you want to vote for? Now, with resiliency strategy one, we want to separate sewer systems because when flooding happens, we have a lot of sewer backup, so we don't want that. We want to update local treatments, uh, water treatment, and build storm basins, and also protect public transit because we've noticed that when it floods, trains tend to stop. Uh, economic, it's kind of low. So we're on a four-star basis of one to four, where one is low economic, or one is low value, four is high. This one is a very expensive policy, however, it's very robust. So we see that developing these uh, new infrastructure will do a lot of good, but it's very expensive. Now the environmental, amazing. We love wastewater treatment plants. They do a lot of good work for us. They prevent water pollution from different runoffs, but it also um, prevents nutrient pollution from uh, our farmers who are, can't prevent their nutrients from their crops to be washed away. However, the water treatment plant can take this and uh, remediate it. Social, uh, it's pretty good. Construction is pretty disruptive, but the important thing, especially for the uh, climate policy folks, is that the separate sewer system prevents residents against pathogens and mold. And your best friend, the person that you work with most, really cares about making sure that its constituents don't get sick because they're the director of public health. All right, resilient strategy number two is uh, creating more uh, green spaces so that the vegetation can actually soak up the water that we're getting and also using innovative materials like porous pavement for groundwater recharge so that rather than the water just sitting on the street, it percolates down. Economic, it's pretty good. Green infrastructure, plants and trees, it's pretty cheap. It's not that bad. It also can help create more short-term jobs, and it, but it has a low direct benefit to non-urban residents. So the farmers might not be helped out as much directly. Environmental, it's three stars. So this helps with overall uh, water runoff because it just seeps back into the ground. And from this and from these estuaries, we're able to treat water pollutants and provide nutrients to plants. It's kind of a win-win. Uh, as well as there's a lot of secondary benefits from green infrastructure, like lower lowering carbon emissions, increasing oxygen production, and lowering the overall uh, urban heat. Something I care about in Arizona, maybe not so much here, unless it's summer, that heat wave, I heard about it. Uh, but it also may disrupt downstream water flow because it's staying in one area. So that people in the next town over, next river town, new river town, might not be getting the water that they need. So that's something else that we need to consider, that that might be a problem. Uh, this also has social benefits because we are able to create more recreational space. So people are actually leaving their houses and uh, developing a better community. However, we might also see that there are potential hazards because with increased vegetation, we get more ticks and we might have more diseases that are transferred that way. All right, now. The last policy, going through these quickly, want to make sure there's enough time, is to, and also while we're going through this, can everyone pull out your phones because you're going to vote uh, remotely. So we're going to, in strategy three, inform the public about uh, here's, here's how you can remain safe during floods. So this is where you can go if your house is in a floodplain. And also here are some resources that are available in case of emergency. So if your house gets flooded, you know how to get government assistance to try and fix this. But it also focuses on utility security to make sure that if there are no, so that rather than having power lines out in the open, they're underground so that those power lines don't fall to make sure that no one is impacted by having no electricity so that if they needed to call for help, they can. This is pretty expensive in terms of the utility lines because we need to take all the ones that are up uh, above ground and put them underneath. However, providing shelter in schools and hospitals during these extreme events and then also providing education has a very high return on investment with little to no cost and it can help prevent loss of life. Uh, environmental, nothing. Nothing really is going to happen with this. The most that we might have is uh, as we put power lines in the ground, it might disrupt some tree root systems. Social is very high because it's directly helping at-risk residents with um, during these extreme weather events. And it also makes sure that they are never isolated 
uh, from the other people in their community and their emergency systems. So, and all cities refuge centers provide safety and uh, different resources. Okay, now again, here are your roles. Don't want you to forget. Again, environmental scientists, climate policy, emergency room doctors, thank you, and farmers at the top. Okay, so if you guys could go to poll.ev slash Caitlin A. Hall 515, please vote for a strategy. Again, where strategy one was deploying water management system upgrades. Thank you, Roll. So this is the separate sewer systems. Um, second is where you're using more green space to prevent flooding issues. And three is when you're informing the public, protecting utilities. Okay. And then, if anybody has any questions on anything, and in terms of this activity, let me know. We're still going to hold our, our questions till the end. And this is where peer pressure starts setting in. You're like, oh shoot, maybe I should go with A. Oh, no B. No C. Oh <laughs> um, yeah, you, you. Okay, so the 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 voice in my mind, the the parrot on my shoulder, is telling me that we shouldn't have moved it over, and I should stop talking. That is also feedback that I'm getting. Okay. Does everyone feel good? Everyone wait. Or are we still waiting? All right, so I'm going to keep this up. No, that's fine. Okay. Guys. Yeah. Okay, but actually, no, this is super important because you're voting because of how other people are voting as well. So if I'm a policymaker, I want to be considerate of you guys are the constituent. I'm a policymaker, you're my constituents. These are things that you care about. You think that A is better, someone thinks that B is better. So there's so many different points of information that policymakers are getting in that they have to balance all of these different aspects. There's so many different priorities that, are, that they have to be cognizant of. It's not just the science, it's also the other people around them. So I think that this is actually good that it just kept moving. I think that that's really indicative as to when, when I'm communicating with, communicating with policymakers, I'm always, I try to be cognizant of that issue. Because, like, yeah, I'm a scientist and I want to use facts to solve all these problems, but that's not just where it stops. They have their own values that they care about. They have the people around them, they have those values to be considerate of as well. So it's just a lot more complicated than I feel like I originally gave it credit for when I started working in policy. Because I was just like, well, the science says that climate change is real, we need to stop this. And it's like, that's true, but it's very expensive to try and change all these different infrastructure. Uh, perspectives that we have. I'm in the U.S. and I don't know why, but a lot of people think climate change is not real. And so there's just a lot of different, yeah, I'll give some chuckles. I, I, I'm frequently the butt of all the jokes and I come to the Netherlands and I've accepted that and I love it. I've embraced it. It fuels me. So, okay. Can you, thank you. But I just kind of want to think back. So some of the lessons that I've learned when I'm doing science policy with policymakers, is I, when I started, didn't know what I was doing. I was just like, there's an issue. Caitlin, I'll work on it, I'll get it done. Hall is gonna just try and do it. So I went to different short courses and different trainings to try and figure out, well, how does one do this? But I can't stress enough that that's just the start. You can't really learn something until you try and do it. And no matter how many workshops I went to, the experience that I had by 
working directly with policymakers on one-on-one -on -one meetings or within a group or within a research project was so much stronger. The next is don't go it alone. I am not working individually. I have 30 some odd grad students and postdocs working with me. So I couldn't do this alone. And no one should have to. And again, your argument is stronger when you are working with other people because if it's only you that cares, maybe it doesn't matter. Another is have an ally on the inside, making sure that, again, you have the support. You start building that relationship, like the relationship I started building with Evo, talking about climbing. We are able to have a connection beyond just work because that's what it, we're building that relationship because he is more willing to spend time to talk to me and work on these issues when it's not just me screaming information at him. Like, here's the science. This is what you should be doing. Why are you not doing this? We're able to have an actual discussion and we're building that relationship and it doesn't just stop at one meeting. I followed up asking about more climbing places. But again, my top lesson is if I have to ask, so what? So what you think that climate change is real and it's a problem? Make me care. Like, a policymaker should never have to think that. Like, if, if your best friend is asking you, all right, that's great, so what? You have lost the battle. So I think that that's my top lesson, is making sure that whenever you're communicating with policymakers, that it's a relationship and then making sure to answer so what, so why should they care? Thank you so much.